In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus made this command. And he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your word. We thank you and praise you for this church and the folk that are here today. I ask you to be our preacher and our teacher. You open up our hearts that we may be able to not just hear, but receive the truths that you have for us. Help us to go and to do what you've called us to go and do in Jesus' name. Amen. So far in this series of studies, we have looked at God's different purposes for our life. We looked at the fact that life is a preparation for eternity. That's what we're here for. We are simply preparing to spend eternity somewhere. Now, if you're saved, you're going to spend eternity in the presence of God. And if you're not saved before the rapture or before you die, then you're going to spend eternity in a place of torment. And I I really want you to make a decision to invite Jesus into your heart if you're here today and you haven't done so. So we're going to talk today about, uh, get you caught up on the four things that we've talked about so far. And the first was to worship. That is to get to know and to love God. And the second is fellowship. And that is to get to know and to love each other. And the third is, was discipleship, which is to make us become more conformed to the image of Christ. And the fourth was service. And that is, last Sunday we talked about using our abilities for God in serving Him. So, uh, now, when you get those four down, when you've got those pretty well worked out in your heart and mind, there's, we're going to look today at our fifth purpose, which is the only purpose that we can do here on this earth that will not just affect us, but will affect everybody around us. And that is, you were made for a mission. You and I were put on this earth for a mission. In John chapter 17, verse 18, Jesus said, In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. So Jesus is making this prayer to the Lord, a father, and he is saying to him, You gave me a mission. Jesus came to this earth with a mission. And that was to to die, that you and I may have life and have it more abundantly, that our sins would be covered in the blood. And then in our last study, we talked about a need uh, that you have in this church for a ministry. So we need not just a ministry, but we need a mission in our life. You see, we need a ministry to believers, but we have a mission to unbelievers. Now, we have this, this ministry is a customized ministry, and the mission is a customized ministry, uh, mission. And so we have a common mission uh, that everybody is involved in. All of us have been called to be involved in this particular mission that we're going to talk about today. And so, uh, what is our mission? Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So what are you being sent to do? What is our mission? The Apostle Paul said uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, the most important thing is that I complete my mission to work the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our mission. That is the fifth purpose is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Once I know that God is in control, and once I know that God made me to love me, and once I know that my life is not an accident, that my life has a purpose, all the things that we've been talking about, God expects me to share those things with somebody else. Everything that we've been talking about, God says, once you understand these first four purposes, then it's going to be easy for you to share what God has done for you and through you. Now, there's another word for this thing, and once is often misunderstood, and that word is called evangelism. Evangelism is simply sharing uh, the good news. That's all it is. Uh, uh, most people, once we think of uh, evangelism, we 
think of some preacher or some priest or some uh, seven-day meeting at a church or something. Like that. And all that's awesome, but evangelism simply means sharing what God has done for me, what God has done in your life. And so, listen to what he says. Jesus made this statement, uh, and he said, you will be my witnesses, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what he's saying here is simple. First of all, we need to start where we are. You need to start at home. We need to start with the people that are closest to us in our life, our friends, our families, people that are closest to us. And then he says, I want you to go to Judea and Samaria. That's like the county next door. There are people that you work with in Burke or Catawba or somewhere else, and you're around them all the time. And you need to find out what their relationship with God is. You say, well, preacher, I don't want to offend somebody. Well, what are you going to do? Send them to hell number two? Listen, let me tell you something. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. You need to understand that God has, and then he said this, <coughs> excuse me, we need to go to the ends of the earth. That is, we need to find a way to be able to share the gospel with the people around the world. And uh, so the first, I want you to notice what he says. He says, I want you to be my witnesses. Now, a witness is somebody who tells what they know. If you go to court and you put a witness on the stand, they have to tell what they know or they wouldn't be a witness. You understand what I'm saying? You, listen, guys, this is not hard. This is not hard stuff here. A witness is tells simply what God has done for me. You see, you are the best expert on your own life. You're the best expert in your own life. I can tell you what the Bible says, but only you can tell somebody what God has done for you. You understand? And, and so God says, I just want you to tell other people what's happened in your life. It's just that simple. You just go out and share it with, with other people everywhere. And so, why does he say this? Because, listen, remember what we've been talking about. God is building a family of people who love and trust him and who are going to spend eternity with him. That's been God's plan all along. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11 says, This was God's plan for all of history, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. God's always had a plan for us. And that plan was for us to, to tell other people about Jesus to get them into our family. Because once they get born again, instantaneously, they are a, a son of God, child of God, and we are adopted into the family of God. Then we become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, and that is the power that God has given us to live the resurrected life. And so he wants us to share what God has done for us. So his work completed in Jesus took the last opportunity before Jesus left this earth. He said, I want you to be my witnesses, to be make disciples of everybody in the whole world. You said, preach, I don't know if we can do that. Yes, we can do that. If we couldn't do it, he wouldn't have told us to do it. Isn't that right? Say yes. yes. Listen, he never calls you to do a job that he doesn't equip you to do. Never does. So it's a simple sermon that he said. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you just need to understand, this is the bottom line. This is the bottom line. Jesus is talking about growing the church, the body of Christ. And we do that by sharing the gospel with other people. Otherwise... Those people that are left behind are going to spend eternity in a place of torment. That you and I, if years ago, well, in the King James it's called hell, in the newer version it's called Hades because it's the abode of the dead. And it's a place of torment. And this is not an either or situation, ladies and gentlemen. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he participated in feeding hungry people and healing sick people, yet he recognized that a hungry, lost person is just that, that he is hungry and he's lost. Therefore, Jesus gave the church our job description. 
And that is knowing that we are to fulfill our assignment and carry on the work on this earth that he was doing. He would not be around any longer to preach sermons from a mountaintop or from a a boat anchored out in the, uh, the lake. So it's up to us. It's my responsibility and your responsibility to, to share what Jesus has told us to do. What did he tell us to do? Share what Jesus had done for me. Now, how hard is that? You say, well, preacher, you know, I, I don't have your personality. I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. So if I'm going to be obedient to God's call on my life, the Bible says I need to do three things. So I'm going to make this thing as simple for you today as I simply can, where when you leave this place, you can do what God's called you to do. And if I do what God's called me to do, then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to have to get some more chairs somewhere. Huh? Amen. Do you, just kind of look around. Just kind of look around a little bit. This place is pretty full. Oh, we got a few right up here out of the spit zone. They didn't want to set in. But I'm going to tell you how we can double our size by next Sunday. You know how we can do that? If everybody brings one somebody with them, then we'll have twice this meeting here next Sunday. And I'll be late preaching because we're going to have to get some more chairs and put out. And wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody that's not going to church? He said, well, preacher, I don't, I don't know anybody that's not going to church. You are lying like a dog. There's people in your own family that's not going to church. And you say, well, they don't, they, their excuse is we won't fit in in that big old church. Then now, well, you don't know until you come. Huh? Say so you're right. Yeah. I, y'all are getting quiet on me up here. I'm not altogether sure I'm not preaching in Episcopal church. If you're pissed at pay, I apologize. But maybe you'll get a little taste. That's, well, anyhow, that's another story. So first of all, to complete my God-given mission, I must share with those in my world. That is, in my own world, I have to share what, I, what God has done for me. What does that mean? That means people that's in my house, people that's in my family, people that I work with, people that I see. You know, listen, you remember that there was a, a guy that was lame and sick and couldn't walk, and, and Jesus healed him up. And so he, he told the Lord uh, uh, in Luke chapter 8, verse uh, 37 and 38, that he wanted to follow him. And this is what Jesus said. He said, go back home and tell people how much God has done for you so that man went all over town telling how much Jesus had done for him. Now, that's exactly what Jesus is telling us to do today. That is exactly. Listen, that guy that just got healed was a beggar. He'd been, he had been lame from the time that he was born. Listen, listen, listen. He didn't know anything about the Scripture. He did not have any theology training. He had never preached a sermon in his entire life. All he knew how to do was hold out a little can and say, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. That's all he knew. And Jesus said, go back to your hometown and tell everybody about me. So know where your mission starts. Right here. In your neighborhood. In your community. God wants you to go to your friends, to your family, to your co-workers, to your neighbors, Anybody who crosses your path, the person who helps you with your gas, the clerk at Ingalls, the, 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 cur- the clerks at Walmart. And you'll have plenty of time to rehearse it if you go to, to a clerk at Walmart because you go out and stand in line for 30 minutes. 200 cash registers and four workers. Now that was some real good planning right there, son. Now, I'm going to tell you, it took a lot of foresight. To be able to do all that. So God says, I want you to share the good news with the people first in your Jerusalem with the people in your home. Now, why don't we do this? Why don't we do what God's told us to do? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons. And one reason is because 
we have bought in to this myth that people aren't interested in spiritual issues anymore. We have, believe, we have bought into the myth that Satan has sold the liberal media. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every single poll, every single survey says Americans are more interested in spiritual things now than they were 10 years ago. Not less, more interested in spiritual issues now. But that's not what we hear. That's not what we're hearing on TV. That's not what we're hearing. You understand? In the recent George Gallup poll, this is what he said. He discovered that 65 million Americans have no church home. 65 million Americans. I'm not talking about China, Japan, or Russia. I'm talking about right here. Right where we live. But listen to this. 34 million of those 65 said they would attend church if somebody would just simply invite them. 34 million people in America sitting out there, not involved in church, not involved in serving God, not involved in doing the things of God, waiting for an invitation. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that horrible? Say yes. Y'all don't let Granny have to talk to me by myself. (laughs) Now let me tell you what's more horrible than that. Are you ready for this? I'm telling you, I'm not going to have a shouting fit right after this. You know why 34 million people have been invited to churches? Because we aren't doing it. I would venture to say, in my sanctified imagination, that 90% of the people sitting in this church today haven't invited anybody to church except in passing. Yeah, I knew that was going to be quiet. You see, the problem is we, don't, we, we use the excuse that we don't know enough of Scripture, or that we don't know. Well, all that stuff is just a bunch of junk. I'm telling you, there are thousands of ways that you can be a witness. This is what God says to me in my life. Listen, you can email people. Uh, th- th- in this day with, you know, hey, D- Darren can tell you the whole world on his telephone. You know, it don't take you long. You can email people. You can send them. You can send them a book. You can send them a card. You, there are all kinds of tools that we can we can use to do. Good. Let me just tell you about a couple in our church that I bragged on all the time, and that's Aaron and Billy Bradshaw. I, as far as I know, neither one of them ever graduated from seminary. Neither one of them are 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 experts, you know, in that area. But because of their ministry in this church. We are now reaching 29 countries for the cause of Christ. And every week in 29 countries, there are thousands and thousands of people that hear my sermons. There are preachers that that hadn't been able to go to seminary because they're in countries that they can't go or can't afford to go. And they get my sermons every week. They can get the manuscript. If they, listen, if they don't have time to work on one, they can take this manuscript right here that I got in my Bible, in this book. This, it's my Bible today. And they can take it and read it and copy it off. And, or they can take it and make a copy of it, take it in their pulpit and preach exactly what I'm preaching here today. Well, they're not preaching exactly what I preach because I chase a bunch of rabbits around when I'm preaching, you know. Mr. Ennis, that wasn't the time to say amen. I just thought I'd let you know. (laughs) I guess y'all know who that was. That was the other side of that family. Have you ever wondered why you, that when we get saved, God just doesn't snatch us up to heaven? You just walk down here and ask Jesus to come in your heart and go, off you go. 
And there's somebody who said, well, uh, I would get saved today, but I don't know where he went. <laughs> he left us here to fulfill our mission on this earth. There's only one reason that your heart is still beating after you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Because you need to use your faith to tell somebody about Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Now listen to what he says. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that it is the will of God that all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now listen to me carefully. Mountain Grove needs to grow. Isn't that true? We need to fill up all these pews, all these chairs in here. We need to fill up everything up here. We need to get some more lights in the balcony where we can fill the balcony up. And then we're going to have to put some more chairs out. We may have to put chairs up here on the pool. You say, preacher, you think we could do that? Absolutely, we could do it. We need to be reaching people for the cause of Christ. Now, the church that does not want to grow is simply out of the will of God. The church that doesn't want to go is basically saying to the world, <coughs> you can go to hell, we really don't care. So the first thing is, I need to share with the world my world. But that's not enough. I need to go beyond my world. I, I need to dare to reach beyond my comfort zone. Love demands that I move out of that. We need to deal with people that's got different backgrounds, different education, different languages, and different economics. Well, I, I can't go overseas to be a missionary. That's true. You may not be able to go overseas to be a missionary. But you can give to our mission efforts. You can give to our missionary efforts. Those of you may or may not know that our missionary that we have been sponsoring in Ghana, Africa, died. You know what he died from? You suffered your cancer. Amen. But so, you know, we still got an orphanage over there, and they'll let us know what else we're going to do about the missionary's situation. But you, the money that you give here goes to a mission program that we can deal with people that are lost, that we won't ever get to see. So, let me ask you another question. Now, this is just personal. Don't answer out loud, you know, because I don't want you to know. Is anybody going to heaven today because of you? Anybody going to heaven today because of you? You know what always thrills me and breaks my heart at the same time? It's when some mom and dad say, Preacher, we want you to talk to our little boy, our little girl about being saved. Well, I jump on that son like a cat on a rat. But you know what breaks my heart? They ought to have that same excitement and same joy. Sit down with your kids and tell them what Jesus is about. Don't, don't let me steal your joy by bringing your kids to me. Hey, I, I, don't, I don't mind. I love doing it. But you have that privilege to lead your family to the Lord. So, I, 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 let me just tell you what, what, what I know because of the surveys and, and the things that I get. In the next 365 days, 2.4 million Americans will die. In the next year, 2.4 million Americans will die, and most of them will go out into, into eternity without Jesus Christ. In the next 365 days, 54 million people in the world will die. And most of them will go out into eternity without Jesus. Those numbers are almost too difficult for us to bear. Now listen to me carefully. You put this in your little memory book right up here. 
If we care, we must share. If we care, we must share. Don't let Satan steal the joy that God has in store for you to tell people about Jesus. Invite somebody to church and tell them you're going to meet them out front. Or you're going to meet them downstairs. You say, well, preacher, somebody get my seat and all they want. You can come up here and spit on. Ain't nobody going to be up here. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's room for you right up here. If you can't find a place, we'll put your chair right up here next to me. And that'll be fun. Then I can use you as an example. <laughs> then Linda will get off the hook for that sermon. You understand? Yeah. If I'm picking on somebody else, she can raise. I want you to think about what we've been talking about today. Now that you're thinking about it, I want you to think about that, that family or that individual that, that's in your family, a family member, somebody you work with, where you have an opportunity. You say, preacher, I, you, you can't, yes, listen, don't tell me you can't. I was in the hospital at Duke, and before I could get out, every night, somebody would come in my room and ask me to pray for them. Every night. One morning, 2.30, there was a nurse came in my room, and she said, Mr. Black, are you asleep? I said, honey, I didn't know you could sleep down here. <laughs> and she, she would, I could tell she was brokenhearted about something. I said... Come over here where I can hold your hand. She came over there and I said, now tell me what's wrong. She said, my mom lives in Oklahoma. And she just called and said that she had breast cancer. And she said, would you pray for me and my mom? I said, sure I will. So I prayed with her. She cried and I cried with her. You know? And, I, and I had, we had a, a nurse that was... was Gay, living in a gay lifestyle. He told me, he said, you're that preacher that rides a motorcycle? I said, yeah, I'm him. He said, well, you probably don't want anything to do with me. I said, why not? He said, because I'm gay. I said, let me tell you something, son. God loves you just like you are. I said, the only difference in the sin that's, that the lifestyle that you're living and the lifestyle that I was living, both of them were bad choices. I said, I love you, buddy. Every single day that I was in that hospital, he'd come in my room and talk to me. I don't know how deep that seed went, but I planted one. You understand what I'm saying? Listen to me. Listen to me. Everybody, I believe, everybody should be, if they aren't already, needs to be interested in spiritual issues in their life. And you and me with, with the key. Us. If we'll do what God called us to do, I promise you, this church will have standing room only next Sunday. Hmm? You say, where are you going to start? I'm going to tell you where you start. If you're not saved, today's where you start. You invite Jesus to come into your life today, that's your first step. And then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to tell somebody else what's going on. We have a, an absolute awesome substance abuse program in this church. And you know what the greatest thing about our substance abuse program is? We tell each other what God has done for us. I tell these guys all the time, if God could fix somebody like me, he could fix anybody. Because hmm? they, ain't, listen, there ain't nobody took more funny colored pills and sucked up more smoke and drank more alcohol than I have. You understand what I'm saying? Are y'all listening to me? Listen, I was in a psycho ward for drugs. I know what it is to try to kill yourself. I know what it is to be in that hole that you don't see any way out. But you know what? 
The psalmist said that he picked me up out of a dark pit and planted my feet on solid rock. And then if you don't think God is so good, right just when I had to leave California, I keep going to prison for Grand Theft Auto, I came home and met a 15-year-old girl. And I, and I was 22. Don't you know, this outlaw with dating a 15 year made her mom and daddy happy. And then we ran away and got married when I was 23 and she was 16. And I think her mama cried until she died. <laughs> you say, well, what does that have to do with us? I'm going to tell you what it has to do with us. Because she wanted to go to church one day. And guess what happened? She asked Jesus to come into her life. Forgive her of her sins and make her a Christian. Now watch this. That's the instrument that God used to turn my life upside down. Before that year was over, I had got my life straightened out with, with God. He had called me to preach. I didn't know anything about preaching. I didn't even like preachers. I still don't like them too much. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, you remember that rabbit we were talking about? Yeah. That's. Let me tell you what God did through a girl that I love today more than I ever have in my entire life. I didn't. I quit school because I, well, I had a little help quitting school, but anyhow, that's a whole other story. I surrendered to preach. Got a high school GED diploma. Graduated from college, graduated from seminary, and today I have two doctorate degrees, all because of God used a woman that I love more. I don't think anybody else could have done what she has done in my life, and God had a plan, and I was a part of that plan, and she was the instrument that he used. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with me? Now listen to me carefully. You never know, you never know what God is going to do through your effort. You read the story in his book that Billy Graham had written years and years ago when he was a 12-year-old boy. He went to a tent revival, and that night he invited Jesus to come in his heart. He said he was scared to death. Because he walked down a, a sawdust trail to get to where the evangelists and the preachers were. Asked Christ to come into his life. That night, God saved a youngster that ended up being one of the greatest preachers that ever preached a sermon. Amen. Never, 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 never underestimate what God can do if you'll let him use you. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, there is somebody out there that you could talk to this week that needs a word of encouragement. They may already be saved, but maybe they got hurt in a church. Now they aren't going. Maybe you could love them back into a fellowship. Maybe you. Maybe you could tell them what God's doing here and invite them to come be a part of it. I'm telling you something, guys. God's up to something here at Mountain Grove. If he, wasn't, if he wasn't up to something, the devil wouldn't be fighting so hard. Huh? Amen. That Satan's done everything he can to take me out. You know what? Give me your best shot. <laughs> Amen. Our daughter-in-law said, Cliff, please don't say that anymore. How many more shots can you take? I said, I can take all he can give me. You know why? Because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. Let's stand together. 
Heads bowed, eyes closed, hands up. Say it out loud with me, Father. More than anything else, I want to fulfill the purposes that you made for me. I want to bring others to know you. I want to help our church do the same. I confess that I can because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you need to make a decision, 